So in this first session, um, we want to reflect on industry, the importance of industry, university partnerships in a post-COVID-19 world. And of course, we don't know what a post-COVID-19 world looks like. But what we mean by that is we want to lift our uh, we want to lift our eyes and look beyond the current situation, our current dealing with uh, with the immediate, and think about what it is that we have that we can hold on into this. Um, uncertain world that lies um, ahead of us. And to join us on this panel, we have a distinguished group, including Mr. Pit van Sale, who is the CEO of your Clippers, who will give an opening talk for us. Um, and thank you very much for that, Mr. Van Sale. We have Professor Tawana Kupe, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Victoria. Professor Baron de Rasmus, who's the Dean of the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences at the University. We have Dr. Marinda Fisser, who is the Director for Strategic Projects um, and partnerships in agriculture um, just recently started with us in Innovation Africa. Professor Emma Steenkamp, who you've just seen, is the director of the Center of Excellence. Dr. Osmond Molonieni, who is the manager of projects and partnerships and Future Africa, um, as well as Innovation Africa, Innovation Africa. So welcome to all of them. And to get us started, I am going to pass it over to Mr. Pit van Sale who will share a presentation with us. Pete, can I pass over to you? Thank you, Bernard. Um, I hope uh, I'm on the screen there. Yes, uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, the mouse is giving me some trouble. You are on, you are on the screen. Thank you. Um, thank you for this opportunity uh, to address you all today um, and allowing me to share a few thoughts uh, about the situation that we are facing. So I'd like to just to start off with uh, your main page when you log on to the Fabi uh, webpage to see what is Fabi all about. Uh, and the first thing that catches your eyes is that you see you only were established in 1997. And it's quite profound, the successes you already achieved and, and the impact that you had on the industry. But as Bernard said, that we are sitting here in a world today where things are very different. And we're looking and people have used this coin of the new normal. And, and what does that mean? Because we are actually facing a pandemic. And what does this pandemic really mean to us? If we just look at the cases to date that has been identified over 4.2 million, unfortunate high level of deaths but positive the recovery rate of people active cases today that we sit down with just by over 2.4 million and in mild condition um, the cold cases that was actually meant people that has actually recovered or unfortunately has passed away and these are the stats that we looked at uh, from a linear point of view the total cases seems to hopefully there's a flattening in that curve we'll come back to that a bit later and then it seems a similar trend if we just look at a logarithmic lock, lock scale, what does that mean? So yes, this new normal has forced us to sit back and think about things differently. We're talking on this platform as we speak today, there's huge talking of a deflation, we're talking about recession, and we're talking even of a potential depression. So there's a lot of negatives that we are facing today, but. As I read a recent article, uh, in a good crisis or a crisis, if I can say it's a good crisis, one should realize that there's always something out of it. And in the article that was published in the Daily Maverick of an interview with Mr. Tito Mbaweni, that's our Minister of Finance for International Guest, there was an interesting comment that was made when he and Mr. Ramaphosa spoke about this whole pandemic that we face and claimed him that this moment was needed, the real, action point, the hallelujah moment, was to bring and implement the change and the reforms that they require. And Mr. Mbeweni's response was, well, we'll be successful. So depending from which side you look at this new normal, it could either be negative or you could see that as a positive point. I would rather look like Bernard said, let's focus on a little bit on the positive side of things. And it's funny, when we look at the positive, there's some fantastic things happen. Our air quality improved. 
no wildlife is going back in certain areas that was you know left before as people dominated those parks we are learning to appreciate our loved ones more you know fantastic new uh, uh, ensembles and fantastic um, virtual choirs were created people were so innovative to share their love and feeling for the crisis that we are in and we have realized that we as a nation as individuals as families we should stand together and bond and embrace and protect each other in this time so let's hope there's there's more to come out of it but i would like to just touch on some very special moment when andrea bocelli did that domo and he had his concert we we sing and praise to the world and he, in, in, in unity and what amazing moment when he finished off with amazing grace so yes the new norm does have its challenges and its moments but I would like to go back to why I was asked today, Professor Coupe, Professor Struer, Professor Abson, thank you for this opportunity to talk about Fabi and a few lessons we learned from this thing called uh, COVID-19. Um, and I've summarized it in this format for you. It's a lot of information, but allow me before we start there, just to go to a specific concept that some of us are quite familiar with, the Black Swan event. And what is this black swan event? This is something that happens that we can't predict. And the question has been raised by so many people, is COVID-19 a black swan event or is it something different? Well, there's a different story. A book was written in 2016 by Michelle Wicker and she coined something called the gray rhino. Now this is a concept of the gray rhino, meaning it says to us, if, I, if you allow me just to share this with you in this format, The gray rhino is coined by her to say, it is a highly, it's this part that I'm gonna to read to you, it's a highly probable threat that, like its relative, the elephant in the room, has not gotten the attention it deserves. Gray rhinos are predicted well in advance and often avoidable if they act in time. So why do leaders and decision makers keep missing clear opportunities to head off proverbial crisis? Why are we not better at dealing with what's right in front of us? And how, and how we do better confronting the gray rhinos facing us today? Quite profound words, if one understand it and try to understand what we are facing today. Is this this black swan or is this this gray rhino? And I've coined in my own world where I operate in our company, we refer to this, let's stay a little bit longer in the problem. So what does that mean, staying a little bit in the problem? It says that we should reflect and review and listen from the lessons that was learned um, from past events and how this would happen in future. So allow me just to talk about this flatten the curve that we've seen earlier. Um, Peter, I cannot hear you. Uh, sorry. There we go. Thank you. Back. I'm sorry. Did the the sound not come through on the on the on the system? No, but we, but we could see the the video. I. I I think the critical part of that video was for me the two circles at the end of the day is the number of infections would be the same. On the one hand, you know, there's a huge peak, and the other side is that you flatten the curve and you spread the infection rate over a longer period. However, the number of people infected is the same. The problem with that is that the element that's missing here, what was the socioeconomic impact of this, this spreading the curve? And this is a critical part that one should look at some of the lessons that, that we can say was learned from this pandemic is summarized in a few high points um, in, in a high level, just to say, first and foremost, the engagement of industry and government. This should happen at the industry forum level. This is where we look at, look at past practices. We should have post-mortem sessions. We should learn and see where, what went wrong 
we should look at specific ideas, look at initiatives to improve on our preparedness. And then, of course, a big thing, government should play a big role, not just be a, a participant, but they should be the leading party this and sponsor these initiatives. Governance. How critical is governance in an environment like this with clear guidelines and implementation of action plans and have risk mitigating plans in place? Our response time. How do we coordinate our responses? Is this a stop-start event or do we really understand where the real threat sits and how to respond? Our information systems. Recently, uh, this parliamentary session was hacked by uh, some very innovative people and horrible pornographic images were shown while the parliament was in session. Can our systems handle this load of people today listening to this conference and this seminar? How does our supply chain fit up and how does it focus on its weaknesses and how does a potential failure look of that such a supply chain? And of course, small businesses, not because we are small, because we rely on a small group of talent and skills. And in an environment like this that we face from an economic crisis side, we tend to lose those skill set. And then that puts your whole business operation at risk. We do not have the extended resources or the ability to fall back into these resources to carry you through these crises. And then our joint exercise and collaboration. The simulated conditions of situations like this, of outbreaks, resurge, impact of pandemics and diseases, is, we can't stress the importance of that today because that leads us into that decision-making and scenario planning and let us understand the time. So lead time is critical and we should understand the need for research and that trigger points that should we look at that would trigger us to actually go into our environment to understand what does this mean? Um, which, we, which levels of research and coordination should be done in this whole supply chain? A little bit closer to Fabi, if I may, uh, we all know what happened in British Columbia with the pine beetle there. I would just like to share this with you if you don't mind. Um, and we understand the impact it has on, on the plantations there. But if an article that was published now uh, recently as on, on 5th of May with some floods that was experienced in, uh, in, Williams, in, in, in BC and Williams Lake, um, the impact of this was that after the 2017 fires, uh, well, I think it's more than 31,000 hectares was decimated, the reason for the fires was uh, most likely the impact of these beetles it had on the actual uh, forest health index in that area. The consequence was that there's a higher fuel load in the plantations, there's more trees dying, and then you have the devastating fires. Well, that's one consequence. The subsequent consequence was this damaging floods that was unprecedented floods that was experienced. And the Fraser River, which is the major waterway into the Pacific Ocean, was polluted with sediments and with all sorts of other debris. So the impact of these diseases and impact of these elements that we look, we do not always understand. And then if you want to look at South Africa with our own shot border, it's, it's as recent as 2017. It's just not yet in Pumbalanga. We are fortunate, but it's not just impacting forestries. It impacts high value growth crops. So the impact and the potential damage these diseases could cause is devastating. And we should try and find and understand the answers to these diseases. The European spruce beetle, um, this is, a, is, a, is an outbreak that is now impacting Europe, first in North America. And there are these little guys uh, going after the sugars in the tree. I hope you can see that. Um, th we have to, in our world, understand and have a better understanding of this. And that brought me to an article I found only after this whole reel broke out. And uh, yeah, you can see after the park beetle in Northern, uh, North America and Europe, uh, a, a group of universities and research institutes came together they posed a certain question with a, with a specific uh, set out is to say, but what can they do from a socioeconomic point of view, human capital point of view, operational point of view? What are these elements, ecological, what systems and what can they develop and with what framework? And they've developed 25 questions, which is profound based on the outbreak in this 2017 of what happened now in British Columbia and Europe. But they published it 
this table, and this table, if you look at the date at the top, this is 1992, and subsequent, and look where all these common names of these beetles are, and um, look at the host that they attack, and the regions which they are native to, but I think these pests and disease are slowly moving across boundaries and borders that we really don't know of. So let me get to those 25 questions, which was quite profound. If you look at number one, what methods can be used to refine current monitoring of outbreaks? And what paleoenvironmental methods can be refined? Now that study the environment in the geology. What are those past events that can we reconstruct? Has this happened before in our planet's history? What are the characteristics of past outbreaks and how do they compare to current outbreaks? If we have a question five, there's the climate change. Does it influence best really past historical future? How can we map that? And if we know this climate change, what does these things mean? If we look at question 17, I'm just raising a few important ones that we can look at. Uh, how can the apparent disconnect be bridged among science, popular media, and public perception about bark beetle disturbances? Now we've heard fake news, my work, you know, uh, if you read, if you travel into the Western province for international colleagues, that's Cape Town, you read that the Stormers won the World Cup for South Africa. And if you're where I live, you know, we all know the true fact is the Blue Bulls win the World Cup for uh, South Africa. It's, it is the sting of people's perception, what people perceive the media and how we think about things. It's very important that we understand the importance of the media today in our world and how should this happen? Question 19, how do we measure efficacy of knowledge transfer across stakeholders in a manner that is contextually specific yet applicable to meet local, national and international need? Profound questions for research after these outbreaks as a framework of questions that we should be asked. And the last one, how does current science and the communication that science influence or modify human values or behavior? So, Vice-Chancellor, I, I will not go through all of these questions. I think, for me, uh, very important things learned about COVID-19 without lingering that point. But I'd like to touch then on the two key issues for me uh, that I think we, we, we need to talk about for Fabi going forward. I'd like to put down as the first one is the importance of universities for me. And the key crux, if one look at your website and what you want to do is development of human capital. What does that mean, this human capital and development for, for university? Well, as a business and industry, we would really like very sharp people that has the ability, the analytical ability, to really stay in the problem and define the problem. And secondly, they need to be inspired. They have to find solutions. And there, I found two quotes that really talks to it for me. And first is Mr. Albert Einstein. In terms of that capital development, every one of us is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing it's stupid. So if we really, and universities tend to, sometimes people tend to put their self-interest before, the real thing that there's there is to create these future leaders for us. And the second gentleman that I think all of us know very well, and pardon me, why I quote him, I'll tell you now, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your own heart. Now, both these guys were dropouts of universities. So it's quite fundamental that they were too telling us how we should think of developing human capital. The next thing is the platform. Now, this is a very important uh, element for me of universities, apart from the development of human capital. It is this thing where at the university, the playing field is a bit level between all of us. This is where we can sit down and define common goals. This is where we can sit down and define the problem together. We can research the problem together because there is the opportunity where we can really as collectiveness sit down and work. So how do we, what does that mean? Well, I found this concept not found, uh, everybody in this room should know and already about this concept of competition. Uh, it's got two elements is where we say we have to collaborate. And there's, there's an element of competition for ourselves. So, okay, great. But what does that really mean and why should we collaborate in this environment and why should we be competitive and why should we then co-opetition 
connection and understand each other how to exist together. So I found this fantastic description of this, and it's attributed to Sun Microsystems co-founder Bill Joy, where he said, no matter who you are, most of the smartest people work for someone else. In a different way, put by a professor in the management business school, that in any given sphere of activity, most of the pertinent knowledge will reside outside the boundaries of any one organization. And the central challenge is to find ways to access that knowledge. So knowledge is dispersed in small bits and pieces all over the place. And to get that knowledge is very difficult. They talk about the stickiness of knowledge. So how do we get that stickiness and how do we get knowledge out of these areas and the various points? And for me, that is the opportunity where I think we can sit in this environment where industry sits, engaging with the platform, and that with the various elements that we just discussed. And then we can see, but then, Hopefully, that is the dynamic environment that you develop is great for us. But this requires leadership. And if I click on leadership, all of a sudden, certain things fall to in place. The importance of universities with its elements that we just discussed. We talk about FABI, the achievements of FABI. We'll talk about that just now. And then industry. So yes, there's competition. We know that. Yes, we know our gray rhinos and black swans, you know, uh, CEOs. Uh, if you really get into hot water sometimes, it's always best to wash your hands. I didn't see that. We couldn't have foresee that. We tend to go, uh, it's, it's a very fantastic excuse. I, I call it bingo moment. But there's a key element I haven't touched based on yet. And that is leadership does not have boundaries. Again, Mr. Jobs, <clears throat> we get so confused about this. Management is about persuading people to do the things they do not want to do. That is, that's why we manage people. While leadership is about inspiring people to do the things they never thought they could. And that is, if we go back, <clears throat> that for me is this element of leadership that we should then look how we should go forward. It's profound. It sounds so simple, but there's no other word to say to reinforce this concept that through that, you will have all the elements that you see. But let me go back to Fabi, uh, Vice Chancellor. I would like to uh, touch based on the recent report of Fabi, um, the annual report that was published. Uh, congratulations to Professor Slippers. Um, I'd like to just drill down to uh, the, the executive summary. But before that, um, you know, when I went through the report, I just realized how fortunate we are as a South African pharmacy. Uh, industry would to have strong leaders like a SAPI and a Mondi uh, that, that carries us and support and the funding and, uh, and play that leadership role in this environment. And uh, we appreciate the contribution of even our small players, but thank you for that leadership for our, for our big corporates that, that help us through this period and assist us in this research. Work. If I may stand on this Executive summary, uh, Professor Slippers. Fantastic. This is your capacity, your reports, what you have to do. There's your first your, uh, 31 years of excellence. Congratulations. Fantastic leaderships came through it. Uh, you talk about the research community, uh, all great words. Um, we talk about the transformation, the growth research, all understanding. But allow me to stand here. And Vice Chancellor, this is the inspiring moment. For us as the industry, we should never ever walk away from this concept that we should be world-class. We should always remain world-class and we should always look after the people that has brought us here and respect that, reflect, review, and ensure that we entrench this. This establishment of the Center of Excellence in pre health Biotechnology, which is now called Plant Health Biotechnology, is so important for our futures, if I hope if I've illustrated in my few minutes, what is that for us? It's, it's extraordinary with the people that's involved and mentorships that they, the leadership, I think it's inspiring. This capacity development, we should proceed. And then, Professor Slippers, I would encourage you to review your statement on your website that you do put your strong international outlook there and say, yes, that we have a very strong focus on South Africa or Southern Africa, but it's actually an international outlook that Fabi has today. Because that's where we sit with the work that we're doing, you're doing with Ms. Allison. It is fantastic and it's great to have that. So let me just jump to the last point. And I know I'm talking a bit longer, but <clears throat> the establishment of the FABI Test Diseases Diagnostic 
clinic. It is profound. And it's a fun, when I read this report late last night, uh, and I was really inspired by this specific element because what you've done here, you take 30 years of data and you put it in, in artificial intelligence and you allow us to do this basic research and diagnostics which we refer and what the lessons we've learned out of COVID. It is, it is a profound, it is, it, is, it is something that we all can be very proud of. So I, I will conclude my talk to go back to Fabi and just say uh, to everyone, thank you for the opportunity. I congratulate you, Fabi, on your successes. It is really inspiring and I encourage you to keep continuing to develop the strong leadership that you have done so over the years. And please, let's never compromise on our status as world-class researchers. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I, I wish we could do a round of applause for, for you know, setting us up so fantastically for, for this day, for the time you've, and the thought you've put into this. You raised so many critical um, issues um, that, that we can unpack further in this, in this talk. So thank you very much for that, for that opening. I'm going to pass over to uh, Professor Coupe, and I'm going to ask Professor Coupe, then Professor Rasmus, Dr. Fisser, Mrs. Dienkamp, and Dr. Molnieri to respond to that and talk to us from their perspective on this issue of university industry partnerships in a post-COVID-19 world. And we will come back to uh, what Mr. Fonsello has just presented to us and the others and unpack that further. So, um, Professor Coupe, if I can ask, uh, you see on this on the screen there the um, our panelist, and I'm going to find um, Professor Coupe and unmute Professor Coupe. If we can do that, to um, I will unmute and camera on. Uh, All right, unmute Professor Coupe, and if, you, if your camera is on, uh, just a second. One. So, so I have a, is it great, Professor Coupe? Thank you, Professor Schippers. Thank you very much. Can I pass? Good morning, the everyone. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here. My first uh, conference for this very long standing and long running conference. I think this is an exciting moment to have this conference. And thank you to Fabi and yourselves, Prof Schippers and others for continuing the conference in this mode. You can see in front of my screen that at this moment, there are 213 participants that are listening or that are participating. We also, so Kupe, I, I can add to that, we, we're actually running two systems and on Microsoft Teams, I'm not sure how oh, many yes. are there, so there's even more. Yeah, I'm on Zoom, so it's 213 on Zoom. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's you or, or Mr. Vanzel who said that uh, post-COVID-19, we will need not less, but more industry, university partnerships. And, and I think that that is absolutely correct and is something we should keep throughout the conversation today. And I think this is important for a number of reasons. Is that a, one of the tests of the vibrancy of a university and its relevance to its context is the extent of its industry relationships and the levels of support that it uh, enjoys from industries. Part of the world rankings, Mr. Van Zell spoke uh, about being world class. Some of the world rankings, which measure universities, take into account or a, or a criterion for industry university relationships and the income that is derived from industry university partnerships. So this is going to be fundamentally even much more important. Remember, we're also talking about a global pandemic. We are talking about something that requires the global store of knowledge that exists and knowledge that is being created. Professor Skippers, you showed the papers that have been published. This global store of knowledge continuously being created will be needed to address a, a range of issues, including the pandemic itself, but more specifically, the, the, the things that the industries that we're talking about, the, the timber industry and related forestry industries and associated industry need in order to be profitable to thrive and to make a difference to society. I also wanted to say that 
I think that this in, uh, university industry partnerships are going to be important for the recovery that is needed for all industries and all economies and all societies going forward. This recovery, remember, is not going to be, a, as the phrase goes, a post-COVID world, 2019, a new world, the new normal. It's not going to be just recovering to what we were before COVID-19. It's going to be also a transition to a new economy and to, to industries recreating themselves. That will include the forestry and associated uh, industries. So therefore, the importance of, uh, uh, if I may put this principle down, the importance of industry university relationships is that the, the, is this exchange of this relationship is, is to support knowledge creation that matters to industries that sustain life or that sustain the world or that sustain humanity. And I think in this we are very lucky that we have far be, as Mr. Van Zell said, a weightless institution which enables South African and African industries because FAPI has international collaborations and partnerships, and that includes African partnerships, that allows FABI to both access global knowledge, but also to create knowledge that it puts into circulation of global knowledge, and that is part of its world class nature. But then the industries that are, uh, have a relationship on the ground with FABI also can access that global knowledge, because FABI is a world class a institution that creates knowledge which goes into global circulation, but it also in its partnerships with other universities, globally, leading institutions, research institutions, also accesses that kind of global knowledge. At the University of Pretoria, we are very uh, uh, serious that going forward, the university will expand its strategic global, local, and global, local, and continental uh, partnerships. And, and the local partnerships will be will also be in the context of what we're talking today with industries as well as with the government. Because as I said, a well-nourished a well university that produces world-class knowledge needs that relevance and that sustenance from the industry. Mr. Van Zyl, I think towards the end, for example, was talking about the data uh, uh, that FIB has uh, create, uh, uh, generated or stores or has created in its diagnostic units and now using a, a fourth industrial related technologies to access. A, a university industry relationships are important for that reason also is that universities can then access that data that comes from very specific industries and be able to analyze, theorize, reflect, and produce a, a, the kind of a, a interventions of, if you like, solutions, if you like, to put it more simplicity, or, or to, to a policy a, 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 a outcomes that will make these industries much more thrive, much more, be much more profitable and add value to society. So the transdisciplinary relationship is very, very important to us. Transdisciplinary in the sense of relationship across many disciplines, artificial intelligence now being used in the diagnostic clinics at Fabi, but and, and a range of other technologies. But also the relationships with be into society itself and primarily codified, if you like, or solidified, if you like, and nourished, if you like, by a relationship with the associated industries and their extensions thereof. So, Professor Slippers, I'd like to open up by saying those few things and then, I, then, 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 then I'll then take it up from there. Professor Coupe, thank you very much for that. Yes, yes indeed. I, I, um... As Mr. Fonsale has referred to, and you, you make that point, that engaging with our industries is a key part of that transdisciplinary community uh, of, of participants that must solve our global problems. Thank you very much for, for that opening. And I want to ask Professor Erasmus, Professor Baron Erasmus, if you would unmute yourself and turn your video on um, so I can pass to you. Um, yeah, thank, thank you very much, Professor Slippers. And it's over to you. Th thank you very much. Uh, th thanks for this opportunity, and uh, thank you for the, the interesting and, and compelling messages from Prof. Cooper and from Mr. Pete Van Sale. I've got short comments this morning. Uh, first off, I've got some general comments around interdisciplinary studies. 
Then I've got some comments around the role of universities in interdisciplinary studies. Then I'd like to highlight some of the key success characteristics of the relationship between higher education and industry. This comes from a number of studies, but also, also from my personal experience. So interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity are buzzwords, but they're important buzzwords. And in the context for today's meeting, we can start asking the question, why do we need it? The answer is almost um, parochial in its simplicity, is that the types of problems that we face are these cross-cutting problems. And cross-cutting problems need cross-cutting solutions. And that by itself sounds quite simple to do, but in reality, it is quite difficult, sometimes more so in academia, to have disciplines and experts, or shall we say experts from different disciplines, reach across traditional disciplinary divides to start understanding each other's uh, fields of study. In many cases, bridging that divide is as simple as the ability to say, I don't understand, please explain. And, uh, and sometimes uh, th this humility is in short supply in the academic sphere, if you, if you, with, uh, with apologies to all my academic colleagues in, in this meeting. Um, <clears throat> so I think we, when we talk about interdisciplinarity, we are not talking about either disciplinary excellence or interdisciplinary excellence. I don't think these concepts are mutually exclusive. As a matter of fact, the one cannot exist without the other. The, the interdisciplines will not be interesting if there is not deep disciplinary scholarships in each of these areas of interest. So these two things go hand in hand. You need the deep disciplinary scholarship and then you need the deep experts that can actually bridge the divides, the change agents, the boundary agents, the translators, call them what you want, but people with the ability to move between disciplines. And sometimes these are the disciplinary experts, but in many cases, and I think this is emerging in more and more places, this becomes a legitimate expertise by itself. Where does university sit in this interdisciplinary game? I think universities have got a unique value proposition for interdisciplinary studies. First of all, Complex sense making is a scarce skill. We all know the standard cartoon showing um, showing the solution to to problems that might be or solutions that are simple but wrong versus complex but right. So <clears throat> this complex sense making is a scarce skill, and it takes years of focused effort to actually gain this skill and also practice. And this practice is not something that only happens in the academic domain. The second value proposition from universities is that a shared understanding is required to enable change. So in the context of the global problems we face, we need a mechanism to create a shared understanding. Without a shared understanding of the original problem, we will not have a shared understanding of what a solution looks like. And once we do have a shared understanding of what the solution look like, looks like, we are actually starting to cross disciplines and sectors, and that is the basis for industry and societal collaboration. The third um, value proposition from university is around that the workforce of the future needs these skills. And Mr. Van Sale mentioned earlier on what does human capacity development mean in a post COVID 19 world? So we need this complex sense making, we need the ability to create the shared understanding. The shared understanding enables change, and we need the workforce of the future to have the skills to effect change along this pathway to impact. And finally, if we do this at scale, universities become the engines of positive change in society. <clears throat> That's what I think the value proposition is from universities for interdisciplinary work. Moving on, what does this mean for a, a post-COVID world? I think, as Prof. Coupe and Mr. Van have mentioned, is a post-COVID world, we're looking at a complete rearrangement of the fundamental drivers of human endeavor. Um, we don't know exactly what that looks like. We start seeing some flickerings of what this future might look like. But the exciting thing and also the challenging thing is that this future to a large extent is up to us. We do have the opportunity to shape it. And our opportunity to shape it depends to some extent on our ability to create the partnerships. This fundamental rearrangement of uh, the drivers of human endeavor will create new interfaces between new partners and new knowledge areas. So all of a sudden, the need for interdisciplinary skills is no longer just focused on problem solving. It is actually a fundamental driver of this rearrangement of this reconfiguring of our post-COVID world. So no longer is this a nice to have, no longer is this um, an interesting academic discussion, and no longer is this a, a fringe activity for companies who think beyond sustainability. It is becoming front and center to the university's mission, and it is becoming front and center to companies that want to survive into this fundamentally rearranged uh, world of ours. 
We see this already in some of the ways in which we respond to diseases. It's not widely known, but the Ebola outbreak, <coughs> the last large Ebola outbreak, not many of us know that there's actually an ongoing Ebola outbreak with about 2,000 um, mortalities in Central Africa right now. But um, the, eventually, the, the biggest impact on the Ebola um, uh, pandemic, or epidemic, I should say, in West Africa, was when anthropologists started analyzing how this disease spread from a human behavior point of view. And I suspect we will start seeing similar answers to COVID. I also think there's a, there's a, a large gap in our understanding of how the way we change the environment affects the likelihood of the emergence of disease and the spread of disease. And I see this as a large area of research that will start emerging. So these are just examples that I'm familiar with at the moment of where we're starting to see um, these new knowledge areas emerging and that we need the people to respond to it. My last point <coughs> is around the nature of um, higher education industry partnerships. And I, I really appreciate the um, introduction from Mr. Van Sale. He really highlighted um, some, some of those key aspects and the fact that he does so from personal experience gives it so much more, more gravitas and, and credibility. I've always thought that, that um, short-sighted university industry partnerships um, that don't go strategic are those partnerships where, the match, where, where there's a mismatch between short-term financial returns on investment and longer-term socioeconomic returns on investment. What the COVID pandemic have showed us is that these two are not mutually exclusive. The short-term financial returns on investment and the long-term socioeconomic returns on investment are linked in ways that we are only beginning to understand. So if we only think on, on annual and maybe three-year risk planning timescales, time we are going to miss the longer-term returns in the socioeconomic sphere. There are different types of partnerships, and there's actually quite a number of useful reviews of them. I'm not going to go into the detail, but broadly, you can characterize the partnerships that have been successful, either as partnerships focused on teaching and learning, or partnerships focused on new funding, partnerships around rethinking the role of the research university, or finally, partnerships that go strategic. And frequently, this is a, a linear pathway of, of increasing cooperation from teaching and learning to new funding, to rethinking to the final strategic one. And I think there's no doubt in my mind that this cooperation that we're talking about today have already gone strategic. And we're already starting to see um, abundant long-term socioeconomic returns and investment um, in, in many different spheres. I'd like to wrap up with four um, recommendations to policymakers, not so much the industry, higher education partners themselves, but the, the policymakers that guide and determine the environment within which these partnerships work. The first recommendation is to the policymakers, please keep the ship steady. Don't, don't have sudden changes in policy to which industry and higher education need to respond. This really upsets the apple cart. So first of all, keep the ship steady. Secondly, give universities the autonomy to operate effectively and form the partnerships. So of course we need oversight, but universities can be, and not always are, but they can be agile in these sorts of relationships and they need the autonomy to determine them. Thirdly, reward the activist collaborative universities. If universities are to become and regain their position as engines of positive change, there is an element and a place for the science, science activist and the activist, activistic scientist. And finally, and this is my last point, echoing what uh, Professor Cooper and Mr. Van Sale have said, strive for excellence. There is absolutely no replacement for talent, quality, and excellence. That is what you start off with, and from there, any partnership uh, has the opportunity to go strategic. Professor Slippers, thank you very much for this opportunity. Professor Rasmus, thank you very much for that. I mean, they, all of you really are touching on so many critical elements that I wish I could highlight. In the interest of time, I'm going to keep on, keep moving on. Um, thank you very much for that. I want to ask if there, Dr. Marinda Fisser, if, if you would put your video on and unmute yourself, um, and I can give you the floor. Dr. Marinda Fisser has recently started working at the University of Pretoria um, in the Innovation Africa uh, initiative as part of that, but she has many years of experience as a leader in agriculture um, and in government. Marinda? Good morning, Bernard. Thank you for the opportunity. And over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And as Bernard indicated, I have worked up until two weeks ago in the grain and oil seeds industry. And one of my responsibilities, one of many, was to ensure 
industry, university and government partnerships over the long term. And we're talking, as Professor Barron uh, Erasmus just indicated, these sort of partnerships, it's not three years, it's long term. We're talking 10 years and beyond. And these sort of partnership agreements was reached between the grain and all seeds industry with government as well as with many other different subsectors within the economy. And these could be private entities such as multinationals. Uh, it consisted of private entities and beyond. So one of my key tasks was this was important and the agricultural sector, whether we're looking at the food sector, fiber or the feed industries, these are all real contributors to GDP in, within the South African context. And what we need to keep in mind during this pandemic and post pandemic, as we are speaking, the very policy makers needs to be hearing from us influence and the influence we can give towards them to not as uh, Barrent indicated, suddenly change certain positions in terms of policies, in terms of strategies that would have driven R&D for this particular sector. The importance of the agricultural sector is too great in terms of the contributions to GDP to suddenly make a turnaround changes on certain policies that will negatively affect outcomes, negatively affect R&D investments up until this point. In fact, now going forward, we need to really be on the front lines to ensure that we get sustainable investments going forward. And in, in fact, even more investments within the grain R&D or the forestry sector or the feed sector for that matter. Why is this important? This is important in terms of a lot of things. One of the areas that I wanna build on and going back to the topic of today, the partnerships. Partnerships is really something you build over years. It's something that the importance of universities, as we speak of, industries currently are relooking their priorities. And what would be important for us as a university going forward is to make sure that we are aligned with those changes because strategic and what was important pre-pandemic could not be important going into and after this pandemic. So we need to align very closely with our existing partners and the partnership agreements to understand whether the priorities that was there pre-pandemic are still the priorities that will be driven post-pandemic. Some of them might change because of slight changes to what this is posed to many industries. Ultimately for industry, and here I'm talking feed, animal, uh, the food industry, or the uh, foresters, ultimately going forward would be getting something out of this. What do they get out of this? And from the partnerships that I was involved in over the years, one will see that universities that is quick to adapt to these different sets of priorities are the ones that ultimately ended up with the funding. And it could be a, 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 a quick adaption in terms of the manner in which they propose these changes. Some were not so quick to ch change and there are certain institutions that was very key on following what they think is the right way. It'd be very important going forward to listen to industry. Importantly too, is to be partnering with government and strengthening those partnerships and making sure that there's alignment or a commonality amongst every all the stakeholders where the government industry in terms of what is these priorities going forward and to continuously talk to your partners to make sure everyone is on the same page in terms of that some of the industries that I was involved in, in terms of what was created ultimately, was wonderful innovation hubs or platforms. And these were placed at universities within the South African context. And they, what universities brought to the table for industry was of course the necessary skills and the capacity to ensure that some of those key priorities, there's outputs at the end of the day. Industry is only concerned about the outputs and performance. And if there's no performance, it's pointless to continue that partnerships. So partnerships needs to be managed and needs to be managed very effectively. Some of the outcomes in terms of these, like I've indicated, 
we have made sure that there was multidisciplinary teams and everyone has referred to this this morning already. Universities lead certain areas, but part of those teams is consortia of different skill sets coming from the industry, coming from government, coming from private multinationals, but the ability of universities and the ability to work together within these sort of uh, multidisciplinary teams will be key going forward because that is what industries want and they wanted results and the best possible cost-effective way for results to be attained would be obviously one of those that makes a game change in terms of getting funding or not getting funding. One of the other areas that we need to concern ourselves with going forward and from the experiences that I was involved with, each and every consortia or disciplinary team and the partnerships, one key area that was always, always common across the partnerships was skills development. And we hear that is important to industry, it's important to government, and of course, it's a benefit to the university as well. And it was important for skills development to take place within these different partnership arrangements, whether it's a formal training from PhD level all the way to the upliftment of, of, of technicians or some of the lower skilled individuals, because that way it's an important aspect for industry to ensure there is employment and employment opportunities also being created. So it's a beneficial relationship and if the beneficiaries can see that everyone wins out of this, then it's very, it's a no-brainer. We have had very successful interactions and partnerships within an industry, for instance, the winter cereals, where at certain universities, hubs were created that is long-term in nature and its beneficiaries and it's the university, of course, and government and industry are the major funders to this. And the funding continues regardless of many different things. There is certain partners that's involved and these partnerships grow over time and over years, but behind the partnership and driving partnerships is a lot of work that needs to take place. It's a lot of understanding people's agendas, understanding where everyone comes from, understanding priorities and priority setting. Another area that pre and post pandemic that we all need to focus on is certainly, and some of the speakers has re, uh, referred to this earlier on, is funding and reprioritization re of budgets, probably as we speak, government is reprioritizing uh, whatever they are having on their tables because money and funding will become limited in a limited factor. So it's important for all of us to ensure and influence that the agricultural sector at large and its important role within the economy does not, does not sacri being sacrificed because a lot of this money will now go towards public health and many other important sectors. But it's our role in within these partnerships agreements to ensure that funding and sustained funding going forward is of utmost importance. If I can highlight just three different areas quickly that we need to take forward as the university, one that across the agricultural sector, regardless the sector you're in, is of course biosecurity, national biosecurity. Now we have a human health crisis on our hands. The next one might be a plant health or animal health crisis. We have many different ones currently in South Africa. We do not want a major crisis to develop. Not for that not to happen, we need to ensure in terms of biosecurity, we are protected and we're putting all the stops in place now to prevent a major collapse in the future within this sector, in, whether it's animal health or plant health. Another big one going forward, of course, is climate resilience. It's very important for the agricultural sector to always be on, your, on our watch and to make sure that we're on top of issues regionally as well as internationally and work with the best skill sets to ensure that this industry and this sector uh, remains valid and sustainable over the long term. Skills development is a huge one going forward that we need to look at and of course food and nutrition security. We cannot stand away from that one 
It's becoming crucially important, particularly for this industry. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Bernard. Rwanda, thank you very much for that. Uh, um, you, you touched on a, a number of critical issues. I think they do not forget the importance uh, of plant health, animal health, in helping us deal with this crisis, including how this might play out over the coming years, is, is, is critically important. But a number of other things, I mean, to move on. Thank you very much, Marinda. I see we, we are running short on time. Um, Emma and, and Osmond, if I can ask you to uh, put your videos on and your microphone, and I can pass the floor over to you. Professor Stenkamp, Emma. Thank you, Bernard. Let me just put my video on. Should um, I share the slide for you? Yes, please. So I want to continue further on um, uh, uh, this line of um, human capital development. Um, and then when I talk about it, then also keep in the back of your mind that this is something that is part of the, uh, a bigger program where we are essentially, um, we need to look after the, the scientific the, the, the science personnel, the, the scientific corps that are essentially going to um, be in the field and, and winning this battle for us. So um, in South Africa and Africa more generally, human capital development is almost always a significant challenge. And to address this issue in the TPCPCTHB, um, we have built an efficient human capital um, development platform that focuses on inclusive postgraduate education and outreach to um, educate um, role players and the general public that is not directly associated with a university. So I visualize this um, platform of ours as a pipeline starting with attracting grade 12s to the university at its very beginning and then all the way through um, BSc graduates, BSc honors, MSc PhD to the post PhD or postdoctoral level. So in this pipeline, I know it's a, a very full slide, um, but maybe Bernard can leave it on for a little bit. Um, mentorship is the primary tool with which knowledge is transferred. After school, or let's say after attaining a BSc graduate, the main way of receiving knowledge is mainly um, through mentorship. So in our center, we place a strong um, emphasis on such mentorships or developmental relationships. And then in our pipeline, we also have a range of interventions to ensure its productivity and quality. Um, I indicate some of them here at the bottom. So. This is just one of the models that is um, employed by, well, this is our model, but it's one of the models to ensure um, human capital development. And um, in a post-COVID-19 world, uh, pipelines such as these are not going to disappear. Um, priorities and things and funding might um, change, but I do not see that um, postgraduate educa education and, and training of our scientific personnel is going to change in any way. But we can discuss that um, later if there is time. That's all from me, Bernard. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that. We can just stop the sharing. Um, <coughs> and I'm going to ask that uh, Dr. Molineni, Ozan Molineni, also the youngest member of this panel, um, and with his whole career unfolding, and he was really very passionate about this interaction between industry and academia. Osmond, if I can pass over to you. Thank you, Emma. Uh, thank you, Bernard, um, and thank you to all, and greetings to all my panel uh, members. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to actually re emphasize. Uh, uh, some of the points that have been made by, by, by fellow panel members. Um, and the first thing is that COVID has uh, placed a uh, science research as well as uh, collaborations with uh, university, academic and industry into the limelight. And uh, at its best, what this presents is an opportunity to show how these partnerships can actually work well 
And by so doing, uh, by so doing, it helps us to debunk the idea that university-linked research uh, is disproportionately preoccupied with knowledge generation uh, to the detriment of developing skills that are necessary for society. And fortunately for the forestry industry uh, in South Africa, the TPCP and the FABI platform uh, um, are a great example to illustrate uh, the debunking of this particular notion. And the reason is that the first thing is that the development of partnerships are strategic, are structured, and they are long-term, and they are built around a shared vision. The research that is conducted is multidisciplinary and is centered on addressing common challenges that require collective uh, action by industry and government. And the third one is that student training acutely incorporates skills required by the industry. And as such, the contribution that is made is that for industry, the contribution is that it, it, it enables them to be competitive, to be sustainable, and to be resilient. Uh, for government, uh, it builds uh, a critical research mass uh, that is important for the knowledge economy. And for academia, it provides relevant and impactful research. And so this is um, against this particular back, uh, backdrop that the University of Pretoria has invested uh, in structured platforms uh, that will extend these particular insights uh, for wider impact. And the first of these is Future Africa. And Future Africa is a pan-African uh, platform that is built on partnerships across academic disciplines, uh, which promotes the exchange of ideas, the development uh, of projects, which are aimed at addressing the complex challenges, uh, uh, societal challenges that are relevant to the continent. Um, its second one is building research networks, which encourages collaboration and also helps bolster the knowledge and expertise pool uh, that will be available uh, for scholars in Africa. And then the third one is the development of research leadership capacity, uh, which has a special focus in young emerging uh, uh, researchers. And this will enable us to, 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 to build a sustainable research system uh, in Africa. The second uh, platform is Innovation Africa. This is a new platform that the University of Pretoria has established, uh, particularly to streamline university and industry collaborations. The idea here is to build institutes and centers that will align university research strength with industry needs and government priorities in order to pursue frontier research. Uh, quite frankly, this is, this, uh, this is similar to what the TPCP has done for over 30 years, what FABI has done uh, fabulously for over 20 years, and quite frankly, what leading uh, um, research intensive universities are embarking as a strategy to engage with industry as well as um, governments. So uh, Innovation Africa does envisage uh, um, uh, collaborating with other industries. Uh, however, forestry and agriculture will be the initial central focus. So the question is, how does a post-COVID uh, world uh, affect these particular platform. Uh, my simple answer in that is that it sh uh, this, shouldn't, this shouldn't be a guess, even though you may have, um, you know, uh, economic downturn in the future and, and, and budgetary constraints that are linked to it. However, my argument is that because uh, these uh, platforms provide access to a rich research, uh, talent tool structure systems that are geared to impact and relevant research and it is also importantly aligned to industry performance and strategic goals and so uh, university um, industry and government partnerships will only be so much more important in this post-COVID world and it is uh, important to say that uh, from the apex office at the University of Pretoria and the University of Pretoria investing in this platform uh, to use the, the language uh, around post uh, around COVID uh, we are seem to be ahead of the curve in actually building these platforms which will be essential for industry and gives industry an opportunity thank you very much for well, thank you very much for that and, and to all our panelists. Uh, I regret a little bit that we've run over and I take full responsibility for that. I uh, not to put it as an excuse, but you know, setting up this, this meeting online has been uh, as, as nerve-wracking and, and challenging as it has been exciting. So understanding exactly how a panel discussion like this would unfold online uh, is, is not so easy. So my apologies to the to the speakers also for yeah, that, that, that we don't have more space to discuss this. Um, but I would like to thank you all for your incredible inputs. I, 
I want to suggest uh, uh, just a second to I think a message coming through. Yeah, I'm going to I, I see. Thanks. So they may just making me aware of a, a message from Ben Durham. And I want to link on to what Ben is doing there and ask everybody who is on here to please take the um, opportunity to write into the chat box. We're not going to have much time now to unpack all of this and to discuss that with the panel. But it would be important to capture those thoughts, I think, for the benefit of all of those. And they stay available so we can read those during the course of the day. So there is a way to, for us to continue the discussion. Ben, I think we, we absolutely agree. And if I need to sort of wrap up um, this session from what I've heard from the various speakers, then um, I, was, I was fascinated by uh, the concept of the great rhino that Mr. Fonsell raised, the fact that um, yeah, we, we think about some of these things as emerging out of the blue, but you know, like with COVID, there's been many, many warnings that uh, there are serious and important issues to deal with. And there were, there's been a number raised um, throughout this discussion, uh, Marinda referring to biosecurity, to the role of climate change, to food, uh, food and nutritional, nutritional security. These are things that we know, and the, and the same with, uh, with our fiber resource. These are the only things that we know that we must plan for. Um, I take from the discussion the, the value, and, and I think that there was incredibly well um, articulated between the different speakers of the role of the university as a platform to bring uh, the various players together, to bring various stakeholders together. Knowledge systems, I, I can't remember who made the point, that, and, and I see uh, Ben is also making that point, the knowledge doesn't sit in the university. The knowledge sits dispersed across a, a global knowledge network and within our industries and within our government. And it's the, the importance of dealing with our, um, our future world that we must now co-create, as, as some of the speakers have pointed out, that convening power, that platform that universities can create are incredibly important. And I think that um, it, it's, as, as I referred to in the beginning, uh, for us it's been an incredible strength going, going into this, seeing just how, to what extent we can rely on the strength and the trust within this team and within this community. And I, for one, take, take a lot of um, strength in reflecting on this uncertain future, this, you know, what universities exactly would look like, what our industries would look like, how our world would look like that I know that we have a strong base from which we can adapt, from which we can work to, um, to co-create this world that lies ahead of us. The, I mean, some of the speakers referred to that. It is also an opportunity for us. We have choices today about creating this new world that we didn't have uh, six months ago. And those are opportunities that we would like to, like to exploit. I'm going to close my contribution there, and perhaps ask our panelists uh, for if there are any of them that want to add one last comment before we close off. And I want to ask all of you to just hold on before you log off for a break. Uh, there's one last thing we want to do and ask you to please capture your comments in the, in the chat boxes. To my panel, are there any last comments that you would want to add to, um, to my summary of the session? It, um, do you want to add something? Yeah, thank you, Bernard. All right. Uh, no, no, nothing, nothing for me either. I just really like the alignment um, and, and the shared understanding that I talked about, which is obviously emerging from all the different panel members. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Professor Coupe, any last comments from you? Yeah, nothing really new to say except to say that it sounds simple, but it's very important that we must strengthen industry university relationships uh, post COVID 19 because the sustainability of industry, the sustainability of universities, and therefore translated into sustainability of society, depends on that strengthening. Exactly. Thank you all again. Thank you to the participants. Thank you to everybody signing in. Husband, uh, it looks like you want to add a last comment. 
Um, thanks, Bernard. Um, the, just one quick one. What I wanted to say, this may seem as uncertain times, but what is important to remember is that uncertainty creates a canvas for opportunity and possibility. Exactly. Thank you very much for that. those wise words, Osman. It does indeed. And with that, I'm going to close this panel. And I want to ask uh, a favor that we can't, one thing we can't do this year is take our annual group photograph as we usually do. So what we would like you to do is please put your video on for a couple of seconds so we can see all of your faces and then we can record that uh, for the bit. So um, Tuan, are you capturing? So we are just taking screenshots of um, everybody um, that is on the call at the moment and we will construct a group picture from that at the end of this meeting. So while, they, while they're busy doing that, Again, just to my panelists, uh, a big thank you. It's absolutely amazing. I, I really wish we had two hours to unpack this. And perhaps we should uh, take some of this and set up a platform where we could do so in greater detail. But I, I much appreciate and I see the comments coming through uh, from many people saying uh, absolutely incredible insights. And thank you for that. All right. Are we, how are we doing on the capturing? Uh, just a, want to go just a few more minutes. Um, can I ask my co conspirators here in the room? Yeah, we're, we're, we're almost we're almost ready with the would you just unmute that one for me as well thanks so much. we're almost done with the capturing um we're going to take a 10 minute break it means that we're going to run a little late uh with, with the start of the next session um, the meeting is just going to stay open all day um so please just come back so 5 to 10 we will start the next session um, if you can just sign back for us uh, just to perhaps point out, so I, I, I do in the room at good social distance and all of them have their masks on and everything inside here has been sterilized. Um, I have Tuan and Martin and Farnes, uh, Tuan de Jong, Martin Kutsia and Farnes Fenter all spread out around the corners of the room and they are helping me manage the systems. I think we're doing a first, I wonder if it's a first ever where we have a group of people that are joining through Microsoft Teams, and we have a group of people joining through Zoom. They can see you on Zoom. Unfortunately, you can't see them on Teams, but they can see you on Zoom. So they can see all the images and they can hear you clearly. And later when we start discussions, you will be able to talk to each other across those platforms. So um, that is thanks to all the work that's going in. Are we done capturing? I think we're done capturing with the group picture. Thank you, everybody, and I will see you in 10 minutes. We will share.